Rabbi Friedman. Hello. Thank God it's Tuesday. Rabbi Friedman, it's been too long. Unbelievable. We forgot how to do it. You're absolutely right. Um, I, th I think it was a year ago since we talked. I believe it was. And, um, oh boy, <laughs> now we have to start all over again. A whole new year, a whole new beginning. And uh, basically, what I wanted to start with is that we've been away for a month. A month of holiness, really. Just, we dived, dove in and really didn't dive out until the beginning of this week, until Sunday. It was just one big, great uh, spiritual experience. And then when we finally had to emerge from it, oh boy, did we have to face uh, a surreal reality. It just, it seemed like, I don't know, whatever oh. we... I'm sorry? Culture shock. Yeah, yeah. Hope and life. But look, it's a new year. And we're here. They said it couldn't be done. <laughs> <laughs> they predicted it would never happen. And here we are. It's a brand new year. Things are moving along nicely. I hope you had a great Yantif. It was so good. It's really, really tough to come back. And uh, to come back to find out that life, I don't know, either it's just by contrast or it became a lot more crazy and evil as uh, while we weren't here for this one month, one period of time, a little, little period of time. But there is also a backlash, right, to all that evil and all that dishonesty and all there's there's the beginnings of a of a reaction. The healthy parts of the of society are re are awakening. Everywhere. It's it's going to be a very dramatic year. Rabbi Friedman, this is what I was hoping for. I was hoping to find out what are we in for because realistically we came out and we got a flood. We're supposed to get a flood of water in accordance to the Torah. We're going through the Parsha of Noah. And instead we got a, I'm sorry to say this, but the tsunami of crap. Really, it just keeps on pouring at us. I mean, we, so much news just in yesterday alone with the... Um, Pandora information about the offshore accounts of all the politicians and the stars and the business people. And it's just, you know, everything we thought was going on, it just came so apparent and so ridiculously uh, upfront. Exposed. Exposed, yes. That's the good news. Yeah, but what is all this exposure going to do for us? Because it seems... Well, first of all, it'll bring clarity. Clarity brings sanity. Sanity brings a little maturity. And maturity brings goodness. I know that sounds like a long path, <laughs> too many steps, but it can happen very quickly. So we must have done something right in our davening or in our prayers. And uh, what, we, what did we ask for, really? What was the central prayer in all of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur? What, what was it? Revelation. Yes. Closeness. Let every created being know who created it. Mm -hmm. And every creature with a breath of life in it should recognize and thank its creator. That's it. I'm not asking much. It's just a little reality. We know we are creations. We understand that so well as a result of science and so on. We know how created we are, and yet we resist the word creator. <laughs> so it's, it's just silly. It's silly. But how is your studio working? Um, Any 
It's there. Well, the changes, the innovations. Everything is working much better than before, but we still apparently have some glitches to um, iron out. And uh, uh, unfortunately, one of them just happened today, but it's probably me. I'm probably rusty after a month of um, not being uh, here physically <laughs> and, and spiritually. <laughs> Missed you a lot. Missed m- missed these um, uh, conversations a lot because yeah, need some need some clarity, Robert Friedman. Because um, really big separation between good and evil, very apparent, very uh, in our face. I mean, uh, so much is coming out, and um, you know, you said we're in for for something. Please let us know what are we in for. A lot of exposure. All the hidden stuff, the hidden evil and the hidden good, they're all coming to the surface. And of course, the good will outweigh the bad. So that the bad will have to surrender. If we can't beat them, join them. So the evil will join the good and make the good that much more intense that much stronger, that much clearer. So really, we don't need to go to Mars. (laughs) We don't. We don't need any drastic new information. We have it all. We just need to see clearly what's in front of us. We don't. We're so distracted. We're so confused. So let's talk about the the Parsha. We're reading about Noyach. Very interesting how the sages can give you two very opposite opinions about Noyach. And yet they're both correct and true. One opinion says Noyach was a great tzaddik. Very good man. God, he found favor in God's eyes and he walked with God and God chose him to renew the world with. But that's only because he lived in a generation where everybody else was so bad. (laughs) He was the best of the worst. That's one opinion. The other opinion is he was so great that even in a generation where no one else offered any inspiration and support, he rose to the top on his own, and he was unbelievably good, despite the odds. So he was more than just good. He was good when it was impossible to be good. So you have two very opposite opinions. The first opinion says he was good relative to the others. But if he were in the generation of really righteous people, he wouldn't be so special. The other opinion is, are you kidding? He could be special even when no one else was. And that's the old story of the glasses half empty or half full. Both are true. It's just a matter of perspective. The thing with Noyach was, the world was new. It was only a thousand years old. And humanity had not yet been worked out. Like, what does it mean to be a human? God was real. There was no question about that. Because creation was new. And they knew their creator. But getting along with each other, that was difficult. So there was crime and there was abuse and there was all sorts of distorted, weird things because they were experimenting. They didn't know what it means to be a human being, pretty much like the chaos of adolescence. The world was in its baby stage. They didn't know what's what. And so they abused each other and they experimented with weird things. Even the animals hadn't settled into their identities. 
And that's why you had these cross breeding of animals that produced weird results, like the saber toothed tiger and the woolly mammoth. These were experiments. And that's why the people who did the experiments drew pictures of their results on the side on the walls of the cave because this was medical uh, scientific information cutting edge stuff you can produce this kind of animal if you crossbreed those kinds of animals and many of them were sterile and wouldn't last very long so he recorded them in pictures on the wall and so on but everything was ridiculous there was no right and wrong there was no there was no definition to being a mensch and so they had to start all over again after the flood the relationship between human beings became very good now the problem was god did he really cause the flood or was that a natural phenomenon is earth a place to stay and live or are we going to get wiped out every thousand years? So being uh, in harmony with each other, the entire world got together on a project to build a tower to reach the heavens and get out of Earth's atmosphere so that they could move to the moon, which was more stable in their scientific view. But God frustrated that plan, and the result was the dispersion. People moved apart because they found themselves speaking different languages. So those who spoke the same language moved away and created their own country, their own city, whatever it was. Now, it's 2,000 years into history, and Avraham appears. Actually, Avraham was born in the year 1948, 1,940 years after Adam and Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve. So it was right at the 2,000 year mark. And he combined the decency of the human being and the awareness and the belief in God. He was able to maturely embrace both. So humankind had become healthy, normal, what they're meant to be. Now it was a time for education. Like adolescence is over, the confusion, the chaos is over. You're more or less intelligent, more or less mature. Now it's time to really start your education. So Avraham started to educate the world. Another difference between Noyach and Avraham is that Noyach was indeed a very righteous person, but he had no effect on anybody else. He had no students, he had no followers, only he got into the ark. He warned everybody else, nobody believed him, nobody was impressed by him. He was all alone with his own family and nobody, not one other person was inspired to join him in the ark. Now that's held against him. But really, that was the stage of development that uh, the world was at. It was like a child trying to get his own act together. He can't be influencing others. He has to learn to stand on his own two feet first. So actually, getting into the ark was like retreating from the world and developing internally. They were in the ark for an entire year, not 40 days and 40 nights. 
So he was 600 years old when he got into the ark, and he was 601 years old when he got out of the ark. Um, a year of introspection, you might say, uh, which tells us that we all need to go through that stage. There's a time when you need to be just with yourself, developing what you are, who you are. Childhood has to be a time of safety, a time of security, shielded from the world, not exposed to it, because you got to be focused on yourself. You can't be distracted with every news, with every cartoon, with every movie that that introduces you to things that you you're not ready to hear, you don't need to hear. It's not part of your life, it's just a distraction. Even boys and girls need to develop into their own genders. A girl needs to become a girl. Boy needs to become a boy. This mixing of, uh, of, of co-educational systems, it's so confusing and unhealthy. And we now see the results. People who are completely grown up and have no idea what their gender is. Because they weren't given the, ch the time to be in the ark by themselves, developing themselves. So it's interesting that in that year that they were in the ark, there was Noyach and his wife, his three sons and their wives, they were not allowed to be intimate. The technical reason is because when there's destruction going on, it's not a time to bring children into the world. But that's the technical reason. The message behind it is everyone had to be introspective. So not interpersonal, which is what intimacy is, but just personal. Take a year, become what you are, and come out of the ark real, healthy. These couple of years, these two years that we've just had, where we were forced into the ark, quarantined, while the chaos raged around us, had that effect. All the people I talk to now, two years later, are saying, wow, this, this really made me stop and think. I had to re, reconsider all my values. I had to reconsider my reality. I thought work was my reality. Eh, it's not. I thought shopping was my reality. No, it's not. Travel, entertainment, sports. Nope. There's an inner world, and I've been neglecting it. And now I'm aware. Now, So most people I talk to are a little more philosophical about themselves. I think maybe the Noah phrase, the Noah stage is kind of over. Now it's time to go out. And with this renewed maturity, tackle the world again. Only this time more effectively. So we've been in the ark. We've gotten to know ourselves a little better. Got rid of some of the craziness, bad habits, false assumptions. Now we're ready to look at the world with, with wise eyes. We're not going to be fooled again. I hope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Um, um, Rabbi Friedman. Now I hear an echo. Um, um, 
it was really, really hard to um, finish with the holidays because all you saw through the whole month of Jewish holidays was real goodness. Like, that was the revelation of real goodness. And it's not because of the partying. It's not because people were getting together, eating good food, dancing for a big part of it. That was all great. But it was this amazing, it was all about goodness. Not for the good, but about the good. And that is something that I tremendously miss after the holidays. Because coming back into the wor- this world, it's all about um, more of how to do good, mo- egotistical good, not, not the worldly good. This is what we see. It's not what we're about. Of course not. I don't want to say that at all. So this is where um, it becomes really, really hard to get back into this swing of things and um, to leave the world of this amazing holiness, goodness, spirituality. And you start to long for it to come to this world so much more. And I think that's what happened personally to me over this past year and a half, two years of craziness, that we always wanted this goodness. We always longed for it. But now we are in pain for it. Now it's just painful not to have it. And especially that for a whole month we really, really experienced it and we're so close to it and now we have to uh, let go. So my big question is, this is our job. It's our job to bring this goodness into this world, get it closer here, not just for us, but for the whole world. And the question is, how do we go about doing it? How do we speed up the process? How do we make everybody feel what we felt for this amazing month? I hope that there are millions of people who feel the way you feel. <laughs> because that is so that is so correct. That's so on on point. Yes, we desperately want to be better now it's not just wishful thinking it's a visceral need as you say and that is that is valuable that is precious that's that's what god is hoping for that we come to a point where doing the right thing is not optional anymore it's the only way to fly So yeah, I hope I hope everybody feels this way. Um, and those who don't yet feel this way, we have to help them along. And we do this by broadcasting. You're you're right there in the center of it. I can do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is this is it. The technology is there for a reason, and it came exactly in the time and the point in history where we were ready, we are ready to use it. Generation ago, we wouldn't know what to do with it. We would just make more cartoons and be (laughs) silly about it. Now we know, we know. It's exactly what we need for our time and for our message. The internet, the mass media, the communication highway, Yep, it's it's right there, and we just have to use it to its maximum, and all for the good. And people are so desperate to hear it; it's it's a perfect match. We have you... the message, we have the method, and we have the interest. What more can you ask? You know, the interesting thing is that I am open to this message completely, and have been from the beginning. But truly, I'm getting it just now. I mean, you have been talking about it for two years on our radio, thank God. And, and, and only now can I say that it's, you know, internalizing. So, and, and I'm an open person. What, what about the rest? What about the rest of the world that is not as open? 
how long can it possibly take for for things to come together the way they should? Well, you can be open to it because you're intelligent, because you're mature, and because you're wise. Or you can be open to it because you're so desperate. <laughs> <laughs> so there are those who are wise and there are those who are desperate. Everybody is ready one way or the other. So usually it takes 40 years for an idea to mature. We don't have that kind of time. So if you say that it happened within two years, wow, that's quick. <laughs> that's quick. And that's someone who's been searching. What about those who are trying to ignore it? Well, you've been searching you know, for, for noble reasons, motivated by high ideals, not out of desperation. Most people are searching for the truth because they're staring at the lie and they can't take it. They're living a lie and they can't take it. So they don't need great nobility or wisdom. It, it has become a visceral need. So they can't maybe articulate, they can't explain what they're looking for, even to themselves. But when they hear it, they'll know it. So we didn't need not worry about the receptiveness of the people. It's there. It's just use the means of communication and communicate what needs to be communicated. It's just putting the pieces together. They're all there. We're missing nothing. And we don't need um, a new revelation. We don't need radical new ideas. We don't. We've got it all. We've had it all along. Either we didn't have the means, the internet, or we didn't have the clarity to appreciate what's in front of our eyes, or we were too selfish to share it. Now, none of those excuses. <laughs> are going to be acceptable. Rabbi Friedman, amazing. Again, this positivity that you bring um, with every word and clarity that you bring to us. And um, can I ask you a question? People think that they are becoming a little bit prophetic now. People think that they feel more and um, <clears throat> and understand more. Um do you think that is true? Uh, yes. Yes, we've gone through the ringer in these two years, and, and we're, we've come out more sensitive, more aware, out of the fog. We were, we were, we were living, I don't know what to... We were living a make-believe existence. Everybody's happy doing what we're doing. And then we stopped doing it, and we realized how much happier we are not doing it. The relief of not going to work and not going to school, maybe even not going to synagogue. What a relief. Because it was all... It was all external it was all make believe it was it was a nice fantasy that we got comfortable with but it wasn't the real thing now we're a little sobered a little intimidated because to have to rethink fundamental principles is scary stuff and that could be the final battle, the final frontier that will bring Mashiach and bring the world to not only its senses, 
but to its perfection. And it, it can be such an amazing world. Beyond anything we've expected. And people were always like, you know, world peace. Wow, you know, how great will that be if there was no war and no animosities and no, you know, no uh, competition among nations and everyone would support everybody else and get along and share. That would be like the perfect kindergarten class. <laughs> And that's the best we could imagine. <laughs> oh, no, it's a lot better than that. It's not a passive peace. Live and let live is, is a very minimalist thinking. You know, and that's barely decent. It's not a high goal. It's not a noble achievement, live and let live. That's just damage control. At least don't do any damage. What, that's good enough? Oh, life is much richer than that. The world has much more potential than that. And this is what we're getting ready for. So don't limit your vision. You know, don't don't settle for the for the minimum. We want a world inspired by godliness. Everything moving upwards, free of the pull of gravity. You know, every, what goes up must come down. What a depressing concept. <laughs> That's it. That's the rule. That's the law of nature. What goes up must come down, which means that if you're in a good mood, you're eventually going to get depressed. <laughs> what <is> that? <laughs> well... Not listening to science now is actually, um, on one hand, illegal, but on the other hand, intelligent. It's really a new insight into science itself. Yeah. The truth of nature is that what went down must come up. <laughs> right? Yeah. The soul comes down to this world in order for the soul and the world to go up. It's the opposite. What goes up must come down. Might as well go into therapy now. <laughs> no. What came down must go up. Because down has no other reason. There's no other purpose. There's no other justification for going down other than to lift up everything else with you when you go up. Robert Friedman, amazing. Unfortunately, this time goes by so fast, and and it's it's full of such insights that w there's no way we can fit it into a 24-hour uh, day, e e even if we could. So, Robert Friedman, this is priceless for for us, for humanity. What you're doing is amazing. Um, the wisdom, the insights that we get from you is just something that keeps us going. And thank God. It's Tuesday, and thank God we have you who can enlighten us and uh, give us, you know, a real perspective of the world, not the fuzzy perspective that someone is trying to paint this fuzzy picture. So thank you so much for the clarity. So to make it very real, do you have a charity box in your house, in your office, in your car, so that whenever you have a loose coin, you can do something magnificent with it? Yes. Like donate it? Yes. Give charity? Give a... Everyone should have that. I agree. A day should not go by when you don't act charitable. Don't wait for somebody to come begging and starving at your door. <laughs> Think about others as a habit. That broadens your horizon. It elevates you above the, the ugliness of the streets. And it, um, it moves us forward greatly in this, in this vast eternal plan that we're supposed to be fulfilling. So talking about practical, 
That is practical, doable daily or even many times a day. No one will ever regret that. No one ever said, I want my nickel back. <laughs> so let's do that. It's a good way to start the year. Fantastic advice. Thank you so much. Um, I don't have one in my car, but now I will. So office, home, yes. Car, didn't think about it. But thank you. You give, you give great ideas absolutely every second of the day. So thank you so much. And uh, hopefully everyone who has listened to us or will listen to us uh, later on on YouTube or on Facebook, uh, we'll take that advice to heart as well. Rabbi Friedman, I take everything you say to heart, and I am so grateful for it, and I hope everyone who does. And we get so many fantastic um, um, responses to this program. People listen to us in Miami, in Russia, in New York, and people are grateful for everything that you're saying. I think this is, if people listen to us, this is the favorite program. So I'm very, very grateful to you for everything you do for us on um, a weekly basis. Thank God it's Tuesday. So thank you so much. 